All right. Um, so welcome to my talk um, on agile development meets corporate security. Um, I will be talking about uh, the experiences that myself and my team made as a team that develops an infrastructure platform for development teams as our customers. Um, and I will specifically talk about our experiences on how to think about platform governance in that context and how we solved um, or how we approach thinking about platform uh, governance. And uh, as I said, uh, my team and I, we actually build and um, operate an infrastructure platform. So that will be the main focus of what I'm going to talk about, but I will also uh, hope to make, uh, to zoom out a little bit at the end and uh, go into the bigger picture of what platform means. And as you will see, when I talk a little bit more about the specifics of uh, the platform that we build, um, there are, um, our product is relatively varied. Uh, so the challenges that we have with regard to governance um, and security are varied as well. Um, from uh, what you can expect from this talk, um, we uh, are going to look uh, into three general topics. First of all, the challenges that arise when agile development and corporate security meet. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I actually mean um, with security governance and compliance in the scope of this presentation. And also I'll elaborate a little bit more on what I see as the challenges obviously between um, those two states of mind. Um, and um, from there on, we'll go into the specifics uh, of how we actually uh, approached the challenges um, in the context of our product and, and of our team. And from there on, um, I will zoom out again a little bit and uh, we'll have a look at what else is needed, not only for platform governance, but also for making good decisions in, a, an, in an environment that presupposes that you want to develop a more agile mindset in a company, for example, also with regard to security. And one of the things that I want to invite you to think just as a thought experiment, or maybe, maybe you have not specifically built uh, infrastructure platforms before. Um, so one of the things that I invite you to think about is you are the owner and manager of a public pool, right? Um, so my team and I have built a public pool. Um, it is, um, it's, it's open, it's not a pandemic. So you can, you're invited to use it we, uh, we invite you to pay a small fee in the entry, uh, you know, at the entrance. Um, and um, then there's, you know, lots of spaces. You can lock up your things in lockers. You can swim. Um, you can enjoy the sun. Um, uh, but uh, as we will see with this example of a public pool, uh, there are challenges um, in actually managing this in a way where you can respond to all the things that can happen when people enjoy the water and the sun. And uh, if you will then want me to manage a public pool in the end, that's, uh, that is something that I'm happy to discuss at the end of the talk. <sighs> Apologies. So uh, let's start with the definition of terms, right? Um, we're going to have a look at, uh, or terms that I will use rather often in, in this presentation is security, governance, and compliance. And um, just to um, make it clear, governance can have a much wider um, meaning than the, the scope that I'm going to use it in. I will presuppose that we want to keep our estate, our public um, pool secure. Um, and so 
um, we will have some rules that define what a secure state of our of our public pool of our estate is. And um, in the governance, when I talk of governance, uh, we will think about which rules these are that define this secure state and how we actually make them. And when I talk about compliance, we will think about how do I even know, how do I get an insight whether people are following the rules or not? Is my estate actually still secure in the scope that I have um, defined? So if we go back briefly to the pool analogy, a, a goal that uh, people may have when visiting the pool is that they don't slip and then you know, hit their nose and start bleeding all over the pool. Um, and so one of the rules that we could put up is don't run on the side of the pool. And then we'll have to check whether how we wanna actually make sure that no one does that, right? We could hire a lifeguard. Or maybe if we are engineers, what we'll probably do is have an, some kind of uh, pattern recognition in the cameras that will then send out automatic messages to people if the camera recognizes someone is running alongside the pool. And I'm sure we can all imagine the problems that uh, this can bring. Um, now, what I also want to, um, what I'll also come back several times about uh, security governance and compliance is that I believe when we work together, um, whatever our different backgrounds and domains are, the, the goal that we have with security is often similar or well understood. So if I'm a business person, I will understand why security is important if I understand that if, some, if my data, for example, is not secure, this can mean GDPR fines. It can mean a loss of, loss, loss of trust. It can mean losing money. So I have a certain interest in security. If I'm a legal person, then I'll have a, uh, an interest in security because I need to adhere to certain standards, especially depending on, on the context of uh, the industry that I'm in. And if I'm an engineer, then I'm usually interested in solving an interesting problem and uh, security has lots of those. So, but to zoom out again, what I really wanna say is, I, I truly think that we as people coming from all different domains can get together if we focus on the goals that we're trying to achieve and work from there to um, build a secure system that is well governable. So um, as you've already, as we've already, uh, or as the, the title of the talk also mentions, um, what we have at the moment or what we see quite often is still a little bit of a clash um, where specifically enterprises that are on the um, journey of what is called enterprise modernization um, are exactly on that journey. There is a well understood need for agile development practices that are usually focused around uh, consumer um, that, around product teams that get their feedback from from their customers. Uh, there's usually a well understood um, need for microservices and and loosely coupled uh, teams and um, applications. And there is still, still usually this interacts though in different uh, areas or in different levels with a more corporate uh, structure, which is still project focused, where there's usually monolithic software. And, and that is very important for uh, governance specifically, where there is a strong culture of central responsibility and central decision-making. Whereas what we need um, if we want to have a more agile approach is actually some way to have a shared responsibility or a shared decision-making. And um, that is why I, next to the technical the solutions, I also wanna focus on how we can actually build this shared responsibility because that is something that is not, that you cannot build with 
tools. It is something that you will build by building a community and by influencing a culture. Um, if we have another look at what the challenges are around, specifically around security, uh, and um, if you've read or um, seen other talks uh, also from ThoughtWorks on security, it is something that comes up rather often is the challenge of what is called a security sandwich, right? Where you have a, um, if, it's, if it's still the truly project-based style, you'll have all your specifications for the project, um, architectural diagrams, everything you need at the beginning before you start that will be checked by uh, the security team or ISAs or whoever is responsible in the organization. Then there is a long um, time of implementation where there's usually no or little feedback between the security people or the security requirements. And at the end of the project, um, the, the uh, result will be checked again. Uh, so the problems are obvious, right? There is um, no input in this um, phase where act the actual code gets written or the actual application gets built um, back to the security people or from the security people. Um, but the, the additional challenge on a cultural perspective that this um, uh, leads to is that security will often be perceived as this external thing. Someone comes, tells us how to be secure. Um, we have designed X, Y, Z and done all this hard work. And now we have to change it all because um, this external team that knows nothing of the, our daily work and our daily worries has said so. And uh, so one of the ways that we approach this on a product level for ourselves, but uh, that we also um, recommend uh, to customer teams is uh, a practice that you also already know from an agile way of thinking, which is having quick feedback loops, right? And in the terms of security, what is usually the buzzword is shifting security left. So you will you want to have a clear understanding of your secure path to, or your path to production, and you will usually start with some threat modeling for a specific component or whatever you're working on. It will go through your path to production and I'm not gonna go into too much detail. We can discuss that later on, uh, but then you will get immediate feedback hopefully um, on whether or not you're on a good way um, with regard to security. Um, feedback loops is something that will come up a lot because that is also what we based um, our thinking about the product on a lot. Also, as you may have noticed, this is kind of where my pool analogy breaks down because I was not really able to think about an agile pool, but maybe if you have an idea of what that could look like, happy to hear it. Um, so I've al al already spoken about that. I believe that we can come to a shared understanding um, with security as a goal, even um, as people from different domains. Um, when it comes to, um, oh, one of the things where I think that becomes very clear is that there are some very clear patterns in security. And um, I just wanted to make this quite obvious. So on the left-hand side, you see the, some of the global institutions, uh, not only global, but some institutions that um, specify security requirements or uh, recommendations. For example, CIS is the Center for Internet Security. Then we have cloud providers that also um, publish recommendations. And then we have the corporation that we work in, which will also have policies and uh, recommendations. And if you compare these, you will see that the concerns they address are um, quite similar to the same. So it'll usually be about mitigating threats and risks. Um, and uh, if you've done threat modeling yourself or are a little bit familiar with it, one of the ways why threat modeling frameworks work so well is because you can think about certain axes along which you um, think about the threats of your um, software or component and so on. Just usually access, uh, securing access, uh, securing data, securing evidence, securing availability. That's a very, very, very rough um, overview, but um, it'll, it's useful because um, it means that uh, 
even if you think um, that there is no real clarity in the policies that you receive, um, the end goal is the same. And, and if we talk to the security stakeholders from the different um, that, we, that we interact with, um, we can always come back to these common security goals. Uh, so now let's get on to the more um, concrete problem. And let me set the scene a little bit uh, for what we do, what my team does, and the um, environment in, in which we um, work. So Eric has already uh, said that uh, we work for a big uh, German industrial company. And this company has decades of experience, right? It is not that the company needs help in understanding security or understanding governance um, or understanding IT, none of that. The, the company has this uh, very much. Um, it is also on a journey of enterprise modernization though. And one of the current challenges that um, we face is that because it is in the state of flux, that I've also described before, right? There's the project monolithic centralized uh, approach at one hand, and then the, the push towards decoupling shared responsibility um, on the other. There is sometimes, sometimes the pathways of communication are broken. There are not all the feedback um, that the centralized structure um, expects work well because at the same time, the responsibility um, is shifted so far away from the central uh, complex. Um, so this is kind of the scope for the client um, and for our product. So the, the platform that we provide is based on AWS. Um, and if you are one of our customers, what you'll get from us is several AWS accounts actually um, that include a runtime um, offering, um, that include an observability stack, that include a networking, um, that include several networking components for talking to the outside world and networking um, to on-prem, and that also provide a key management service and a governance product, which is what I'm going to elaborate on. Uh, so, one of the things that I want to, so, uh, yeah. and uh, the, the, the way that we approach our product and our platform is very much around trying to see it as a product, trying to get feedback from our customers, from the developers who use it and then incorporate that, um, automate all the things. And um, we're, yeah. Um, as I've already talked briefly about what our offerings are with regard to observability and, um, networking and so on, you can also kind of imagine the surface of what we have to govern, right? Uh, so we have to keep an eye on um, traffic, for example. We have to keep an eye on um, how IM uh, roles are used. We have to keep an eye on are there secrets in the logs or not? Um, and an additional challenge we have in that is actually defining the responsibility boundaries, even for us as a platform. So we want to keep our estate secure. We want to stay um, compliant ourselves with the requirement that we get. Um, and we want to, of course, understand if we are still secure and compliant. But on the other hand, we, for example, do not own the AWS organization. So we get the accounts uh, from a different, from another team. Um, and we give the accounts to our customers who themselves are responsible for quite a number of things on the platform. And so keeping an eye on whether everyone is playing by the rules is um, really, really challenging. And before I go off on, um, how we approach this, uh, I just want to invite you to one more thought experiment, and that is, um, what would you do if you were 
on your own, right? And like, just to make it absolutely clear, we are not on our own. We have very clear uh, policies and requirements. There is a security team. Um, but um, what I find interesting about this uh, thought experiment is that on the one hand side, um, or when I've put this question to people, on the one hand side, the response was, oh, then we can, you know, finally get on with things. So a reflection of this, um, that security scene is often seen as something externally um, ex uh, imposed that um, you have to work with, um, but usually don't have time to do properly. Um, and on the other hand, uh, if you are now in our situation where you are building, you have built a platform and need to stay compliant, this uh, creates a whole stack of challenges because um, you know what you want to do or given that you know what you want to do to, st uh, to stay secure or what you, uh, that you know what secure means for you, you will now have to challenge that um, you want to actually check whether, whether the platform, whether your estate is, is still secure. Um, so one of the things how we approach this challenge is um, by being in proactive and continuous conversations with our stakeholders and the stakeholders with regard to security um, on, uh, our, on the one side, our customers, um, and on the other side, they are the security people, right? So the ISOs, ISAs, um, the uh, incident response team, or just more generally the requirements that we get. Um, and I mean, talking to stakeholders, that sounds like, that sound, probably sounds like a very obvious thing <laughs> and an obvious ask, but um, it is something that you need to invest in explicitly and we, that we do ex uh, invest in explicitly. So we will proactively set up meetings with the ISAs to discuss uh, design changes. We will proactively set up uh, meetings to give them feedback on how we think about platform security. Um, and not only will we um, try to have these very um, eye level conversations, but also follow these up with actions, right? So um, if we need to mitigate a threat, uh, we will give a clear timeline and then um, act on it. And if we build a governance product, we will pull them in to get uh, their feedback on it and understand how does this make your life easier? How does this feed into the, um, the, the job that you're trying to do, uh, not only as, uh, for example, ISAs, but also um, as, the, as, a, as, a, as an entity that is responsible for security. And of course, we're also talking to our customers um, because one of the things that we want to do or that we are also able to do is to make their life easier as well, right? Because we as a platform are kind of in the middle. And I think just to say this explicitly, um, what I meant a little bit with shared responsibility, finding these boundaries between what does the developer team need to do? What does the platform have to do? What, is the, what does the security team have to do? And there's other uh, boundaries as well, but those are our most important ones. It's not a trivial thing, but it is really worth thinking about. Otherwise, you will have, first of all, a lot of duplicated effort where people will try to reinvent things or re-implement things that can, should be handled centrally. And that's where we come to the more general platform governance. Um, then there are things that people cannot take care of themselves because they don't own that particular piece of infrastructure. Um, and then there are um, things that actually belong to the team where, uh, for example, the platform cannot be, cannot say anything about it. So how did we approach this um, from a from an work organization perspective? Um, we made the decision that even security is something you can iterate over. Um, and I can understand if that is a, maybe not the most obvious uh, thought because obviously if you try to be secure, right? You, you have to go all the way uh, uh, security in small bits and bytes that does not seem like a very comfortable thought. 
Um, but uh, as we have seen with lots of other things, if you try to de design the most perfect product, what you'll usually do is design and design and then not actually end up with more security um, because you never get around to implementing. And I know I'm dramatic, dramatizing a little bit, but I think you all know what I mean. So um, what we what we decided to do is basically we, we won't boil the ocean or the public pool. We will iterate even about our governance and uh, we will start with a small rule set of uh, what we most want to keep an eye on. And now we'll have a brief look at the technical part of what we actually did. Um, so this is uh, a very um, simplified view of how our governance MVP works. It is based on AWS config. And um, as I said, we started out with a small rule set of deterministic rules. Um, and I will say more about the rules in a minute. But if we come back to the thought of uh, that I introduced at the beginning of what is governance and what is compliance, uh, we see on the left hand, uh, upper left hand side, the AWF config. Um, there, the, the, the tool from AWS actually gives us the possibility to, to get an idea of, to get an insight into um, what is the state of our, of, of, of the account of, of our estate, right? Um, AWS Config is a tool that uh, scans uh, across um, AWS resources. Not everything is um, supported as of yet, but uh, it is uh, certainly fits our use case very well. And then on the uh, lower branch, you'll see rule evaluation. So this is where we actually check the compliance part um, and uh, can see whether our estate is uh, still secure based on what we expect it to be. Um, and we'll, like I said, we'll come to the rules in a minute. But um, what we're doing here essentially in the rule evaluation is we check uh, corporate requirements, right? Um, so we broke down the rules um, in a way that enables us to actually see the requirement that we get from, from the corporation, are these in place or not? Are we still compliant to that or not? And uh, we do this in an automatic manner. Um, and uh, we also try to respond to that in an automatic manner. I'll come to that in a, in a second. Uh, one thing that I want to mention briefly uh, that is actually quite useful if you are um, interested in thinking about governance in a cloud context um, that is not immediately obvious uh, is that um, one of the things that you get from a cloud provider is actually a really easy initial way to do asset management because your cloud provider will have a very good idea of the resources you use if only because they are interested in billing you for their use. So um, asset management itself can be quite a challenging um, uh, thing to do well, uh, especially across several providers. But if you start off, uh, leveraging someone else's insight is uh, extremely helpful when it comes to asset management. Now let's have a look at, at the rules that we actually evaluate. And when I say our house, our rules, that is of course not, not entirely true. Um, or actually not at all true. Um, we thought quite carefully about how we, how we generate these rules. And we started out with 10 of them and they're only gonna go into three. We add rules as we come across things that we want to check, right? Like if we say we need this to be secure, we can add in governance rule and then uh, get a, a new insight. Um, but the way we generated our, our rules is something that I have also already hinted at. We had a look at what does the Center, Net, uh, Center for Internet Security uh, describe in its benchmark. We had a look at the um, security pillar from the well architected framework. And then of course we went, talked to the ISAs. We had a look at the um, policies and requirements from, uh, from the corporation itself. And uh, out of that, we generated our rules. They are deterministic. They are, so at the end, you can evaluate them to true or false. Um, they are short. And we try to formulate them in a way that they are goal-oriented, if you want. And I'll, I'll, 
I think it will become more clear when I tell you the three that we're going to talk about. One of the rules that we have in our, um, if you're a customer on our, on our platform is no internet gateway exists in the account. Now, this is uh, not a usual design, but it is something that is important for us. Um, it's an important requirement. And so we um, make sure that there is no internet gateway in your AWS account because we need you to use the internet uh, traffic pass or the traffic pass overall that we provide. Uh, the second rule is data is encrypted at rest. Um, and the third one is CloudTrail exists in the account. So that we have a way if something happens to check um, to at least have the, the audit trail, right? Um, so one of the things that we also focused on is that, um, and here we, we go with the feedback loops, is that uh, governance should be actionable. So um, we wanted to, to approach this from a way where either um, if, if non-compliance is found, if, if the, this, uh, this, the platform is not secure, either we can auto-remediate this. So any of the rules that are where the infrastructure is owned by the platform, for example, the first rule with uh, internet gateway should not exist in an account, we can auto-remediate that, right? If we find an internet gateway in the account, it'll be deleted. Yes, that requirement that requires communication of this rule and of this expectation, but um, then that is something that the platform team can own, and uh, we don't. We don't. We can do this hand, hands off. If we have, uh, for example, the second rule, um, data must be um, encrypted at rest. Um, that is something that actually where the responsibility lies by, uh, uh, with our customers to. Um, follow up on that if that is found. And so what we need to do is obviously alert them if um, it is found that uh, a, a resource that stores data, so a database, S3 bucket, DBS volume, and so on is not encrypted. Uh, but what we really wanted to make sure is that we alert the right people and that the alerts that we send out um, include uh, already guidance on where they can find information on how to remediate that. So they don't, they are not just uh, informed, hey, you're, there's this S3 bucket that is unencrypted, but there's a link to documentation or run books on what they can do about this. Um, now, even uh, so, this is this is a very um, rosy picture, right? So we auto remediate, we alert uh, people. There's a run book. People react. Everything is brilliant. Um, no more non-compliance, and of course that is not necessarily the case. Um, so, how did we think about addressing that? Um, and again, one of the things that we think about, and I'll give it an example for that in a second, is trying to make security as easily as possible. So making it easy, uh, as easy as making it as easy as possible for our customers to actually be compliant by default. Um, and then of course, we have to think about escalation and accountability. But if we stick with the compliance by default for a second, one of the offerings that I mentioned very, very briefly is um, our key management as a product. So um, what you will get from us, uh, other than your AWS accounts, is a set of um, customer managed keys for complicated reasons um, that already, that exist in a central account where we make, make uh, certain guarantees about how those are managed. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can we can certainly talk about that later. I see I see Keith's face on that. <laughs> um, and uh, but what we'll what we'll do what we'll set up for you is um, make sure that the IAM roles that need to use this key already have all the grants and permissions to to use this key. And for example, in the in the um, 
for our runtime offering, which is based on EKS, we uh, set the configuration so that it is actually not possible to have an unencrypted EBS volume att attached to the cluster. And so we try to make it as easy as possible to be compliant. All of this has sharp edges as well. Um, brief word on escalation and um, or on alert escalation, escalation paths and accountability. Um, now, one of the things that we do is we also map the severity of um, a threat or a requirement to our rules. So our rule breaches or non-compliance to the rules has different severities, which is in one uh, way depicted uh, by how we alert on them, but also how much time you have to actually mitigate things, which we try to pick up from the requirements with, that we know about from corporate security. And um, then, and we are, we are still working on that, um, uh, is to actually have good escalation paths back to the central uh, team um, or ensure that, that these are not neglected, right? That um, we inform from our side if, um, if, uh, if we find non-compliance or um, more specifically, this actually already flows into uh, what do we, how do we find out if we have a security incident? How do we manage security incidents on the platform and so on? Um, one of the challenges that we still face is accountability um, in the context of, uh, since we, we are a platform, an infrastructure platform, we should not, uh, our power of what we could do should be limited, right? Um, and I'm sure there's, we can argue about that, but um, it's probably not a good idea if um, we have the right to punish people for non-compliance. On the other hand, there needs to be accountability. So that is a challenging problem to solve, which can only be solved through communication and, and patience. And one big thing to avoid, especially, especially in this context, is uh, establishing a blame culture, right? When something happens or when something is hard, it's usually the problem that there is still missing knowledge or that things are unclear or expectations have not been communicated well. And that is something that we try to drive. So actually focus again on talking to people and uh, enabling them to be compliant, understanding what the problem is. And there we come to the community building. So um, one of the things that we um, try to be active in is the security uh, community. And uh, we try to share our, our code, our experiences, our failures, the way we think about things, have conversations with people um, and share our vision of um, where responsibility boundaries lie, where central responsibilities lie, where platform responsibilities lie and so on, have this communicate or have this conversation um, explicitly. And uh, by this, we, we hope uh, to also feed back into the thinking around security, into the thinking uh, of governance as uh, something that can be, doesn't have to be this external force, but uh, can be quite agile and um, can go hand in hand with delivering value quickly if you want to break it down to that. Um, I want to have a very brief moment to talk about uh, what I call shiny things, so tools, and I think uh, what I've talked about before makes that very clear. Um, you may be surprised that we only that I only introduced uh, AWS Config. There are so many tools you can use, right? Um, but um, the dark side of the patterns of security that I talked about is that if you are not careful about how you choose your tools, um, you will get lots of um, repeat findings, right? Um, and if you then have to forward these to people who maybe are not well versed in platform security, that will probably um, create a lot of confusion. So um, happy to talk about that more later, but um, you need to be careful in the, in the choice of your tools. 
So I hope what I was able to kind of get across is that um, there are common patterns that help us to find a common ground when it comes to corporate security requirements and um, what we as a more, um, or that create infrastructure for an agile world. Um, we, we can find common ground. Um, you can treat your governance product as you do your infrastructure, automate all the things, auto remediate as much as possible. And um, building a community lets you build momentum in changing security thinking. All right, thank you very much for your patience and uh, for listening to me. Yeah, thank you.